Uh, sorry, this, on this wonderfully created day, it is, the theme is going to be God is light. And what, what a magnificent theme that, that is. It should be pretty obvious that eyes need light to see. We cannot see infrared, for example. We cannot even see in the dark. So I don't know if some of you people have experienced complete dark, like pitch black. I have. It was in a cave once, and there was no natural light in this cave. And we went in there, and they asked us to turn off our headlamps. It was a two-up thing. And um, so we turned off our headlamps just to experience the dark. And it was so dark, like I tested, and I put my hand in front of my face. I couldn't even see my hand, but I knew my hand was there. So that means even though we could have perfectly functioning eyes, it, even if it, is, sorry, if, if it is pitch black, we are effectively blind. It doesn't matter if our eyes are perfectly healthy and functioning as they should. If you're in the dark, you simply cannot see. You're blind. How then, how then do we see in the dark? We turn on a light. As soon as the light is turned on, the darkness instantly flees. It is gone, vanished. The darkness has absolutely no place in the light. Now, I want to share with you something profound. If we are completely and utterly reliant on natural light to see anything, how much more will, will we be able to see through the light that comes from God? Oh, sorry, that's a bit small. <laughs> um, so that's a verse there, 1 John 1, 5. This is the message we have heard from him to proclaim to you that God is light and in him is no darkness at all. So let us pray. Father God, Lord Jesus and Holy Spirit, we thank you for your light. We thank you that you are the light. We thank you that you have graced us with your light. We thank you that darkness flees from light, your presence. We bless you, Lord, with all that is in us because even though humanity has fallen, you have offered us a way out of our own darkness. You gave us the light to behold and to believe. That light was and still is the Lord Jesus Christ. Believe. For those who still choose to stumble around in the darkness, you know who they are, Lord. For you desire everyone to be saved and to come to the full knowledge of the truth. So we most wholeheartedly pray that you, Father, of loving kindness and mercy, will get to work in those dark and stony hearts that they will find their Sabbath rest in the name of Jesus and that they will be able to step away from their own personal darkness so that they can come so that they can become fully saturated with your light because you created them to be your vessels lord vessels of your spirit your light fill them my lord fill them with your presence and comfort transform them make them anew in the name of jesus Well, welcome. Thanks for the introduction, Carl. And yes, it's true. I am. I do have a PhD in organic chemistry, um, so I can fully vouch that I am a scientist who has seen the light and accepted that it is only by the light of God that I can truly see. It is also true that uh, Carl knows me well, and that Carl is a good, good man and a fellow servant of the Lord. Carl and I, in fact, were co-workers for the Lord a number of years ago now. And yes, as Carl alluded to, I might have more tertiary qualifications than anyone can poke a stick at, but it's not my quali tertiary qualifications that qualify me to speak here today in this house for the Lord. But I'm I am a humble servant of the Lord and I gratefully accept with honour this invitation to speak today. We are all equal in Christ and I'm here to serve. May, uh, hang on, I need to go. 
Oh, I do apologise, that is far too small. <laughs> so what I'm talking about there is may I boast in the Lord Jesus and may every boast that I make be in the Lord Jesus because of what he did on that day, on that cross, for me, for you, for anyone who is listening to this and for the world. There is always much to say about that day. For the, It still blows the mind and fills the heart. But what I'm going to share with you today is some of my calling in the Lord. And in doing so, I hope that you are not only encouraged and comforted, but also equipped not only to defend the faith, but preach it with vigour and purpose to those who are blind and to those who are stumbling around in the dark. What I have been asked to do for Jesus is bear witness to the work of Christ to some of the most hostile opponents to Christianity. In other words, I bring the gospel to atheists, the people who are most outwardly hostile to God's word. Atheism is kind of a broad term, and... I guess technically anyone who doesn't believe in, a, in the theistic God of the Bible is an atheist. So by definition, even a Hindu or a Buddhist is an atheist. But what I specifically do, or more precisely, what the Lord has asked me to do is preach the gospel to secular atheists, those who are vocally hostile to the word of God. These people that I encounter and who desperately need to be saved typically use scientific arguments to defend themselves. Hence, I am readily equipped for this task with my background. Of course, the Lord didn't tell me this when I first started my science degree, but when the time was right, he asked me to offer up my science career to him for his purposes. And slowly over time, he has equipped me to be one, one of his mouthpieces to those who, delo- uh, sorry, those who desire to live in darkness and shun the light of the Lord. So even in the darkness, they have no place to hide because the darkness flees from the light and I shine God's light in dark places. So what do I mean by dark places? What I mean is the darkest places, as in plural, the darkest places on earth are certain people's minds and hearts that have been shut off to God. Those who refuse to even consider God and his way, those who refuse to acknowledge his goodness and loving kindness and mercy, and we could go on for quite some time to add many more words to that list to describe God, but we only have 45 minutes. So those are the darkest places that I'm talking about. People who are finding some reason to hide behind to not believe. And I go and expose all of that to them. I hear from a lot of atheists a phrase that goes something like this. I just don't see any evidence of God. Well, of course, if you're in the dark, you won't see a thing because it's blindness. Do not think for one moment that it is a coincidence that Jesus performed so many sight-restoring miracles. He made the blind see. The message there is even a blind man can see Jesus. When I talk about science and faith and Christianity to darkened minds and hearts, There's been some surprises as to where some of our conversations have headed. There's been conversations about demons, about aliens of all things, about sin, about pain, and why does God let bad things happen to good people? There's been conversations about things like abortions, and the list can go on. But today, the discussion will be about science and faith, namely, is science against faith? is science against God. Well, how we start with this discussion today, and I'll have to limit our discussion to certain topics, 
But one conversation I had a number of years ago with a work colleague has always stuck with me. This person obviously knew I was a scientist and he also knew that I attended and served in a church. He knew this because I told him. Anyway, his question to me was after a few weeks of knowing each other, he asked me, did I still go to church? I said, of course. But then a few weeks later, he asked me again the exact same question. Did I still go to church? Then it dawned on me as to what he was getting at. How is a scientist going to church? You see, it is the belief that the church, the church is so anti-science and so is the Bible and so forth. So his hope was that me, using my science sense, I would realise that no scientist is supposed to go to church. So otherwise, he was implying that I was out of my mind. Well, he had some surprises. So at this point, when I was talking to this fellow, I had already written and self-published my first book on matters of science and faith. I do apologise, that's terrible. Um, so this book uh, hasn't been widely disseminated at this stage because after I published the book, the Lord gave me another blessing, fatherhood. But in saying that, a few of the arguments in the book that I've written about have been disseminated as I have engaged the people who are on the way to becoming Christians. This book is still available on Amazon, but I'm in the process of rewriting it extensively to make an even stronger argument for science and faith. Plus, some parts of it will be cut out and pasted into another book that is in the works, so stay tuned. Currently, the, this reworked version of The God Who Gave Us Science, which is the title I gave the book, is almost at the stage where it will be edited by my publishing associates. But then, sorry, and then, and, and then it will be widely disseminated. Plus, there are many more books to come on apologetics and biblical studies, so stay tuned. Anyway, before I digress any further, the topic at hand science and faith. How conversations with atheists usually progress is normally an insulting and derogatory statement or question comes from them. They just want to get under your skin. I respond to the statement or the question and never to the insult. And normally there's a response back and forth, back and forth, just like a normal conversation, until it gets to a point where they stop asking the questions and they usually disappear. So what do I mean by disappearing? So m many of the atheists I encounter are online and these people are not hard to find. I was actually talking and encouraging a young Christian uh, about this uh, last month, I believe, and she asked me, like, where do you meet these people? We meet these people. And as I said, they are not hard to find. And you, you can normally find them trolling Christian pages on Facebook and so forth. And I, I, I also engage in my line because it also enables me to be a supervising parent to my young children while also preaching the gospel who desperately need to hear it the most. And also it gives an opportunity for... Uh, third parties, as in like other people who might be able to see the conversation as well, to see what I am saying in response to some of these, uh, at times, offensive statements that they make. But I'll have to highlight the greatest benefit of gauging these people online. In most cases, for example, they are making posts on Facebook using their real name and they have their face in their profile picture. So what am I getting at? Well, you have a name and a face you can picture in your mind when you are praying for them. I sow the seed and the Lord makes it grow. We know this from 1 Corinthians 3.7. 
Though neither he who plants nor he who waters is anything, but only God who gives the growth. And we can also look for, a, uh, sorry, look at Isaiah chapter 30, verse 23, where it talks about God causes the increase. You see, it doesn't have to be anything fancy or new. It's just keep the strategy simple and we can use everything at our disposal that our master and teacher, Jesus, has given us. The goal is not novelty, it is salvation. So our model is always Jesus and is a prime example of where we can look to. Luke chapter 20. Oh, there we go. So we have an entire chapter here set in a temple where Jesus, Jesus' authority is challenged. First, for, oh, sorry, firstly challenged in verses 1 to 8 because the temple authorities, the Sadducees, the scribes and the Sanhedrin had assumed authority because they assumed the entry into God's kingdom was through a thorough understanding of the Torah. The Jewish authorities uh, had what's called the three T's in that time. Temple, Torah and territory, that is, the territory of Israel as a nation or kingdom. But Jesus came, came along and says, I fulfill the Torah. So therefore, Jesus is the entry into God's kingdom. So there was a back and the forth, a back and the forth question and response between Jesus and the assumed authorities. Jesus responded with a parable of the wicked tenants in verse nine, verses 19, sorry, 9 to 18. Then they responded with a question of paying a tax to Caesar, to which Jesus responded, to, sorry, to which Jesus responded, uh, sorry, he, sorry, he responded to that and he followed with another question and response and that was that Jesus asked about the resurrection. So as you can see there was question and response, back and forth question and response until and this is what I call the Luke 2040 moment. Verse 40 says, and no one dared to ask him any more questions. In other words, the Jewish Authorities were starting to realise the real authority who was Jesus. And in other words, they realised their assumed authority was starting to fall to pieces when they realised the real authority was standing right in front of them. And Jesus ended, ended this, I guess, back and forth question and response sequence with a beautiful phrase whose son is the Christ, from verse 41. But he said to them, how can they say that, Jesus, sorry, that the Christ is David's son? Because if these assumed authorities really knew their Old Testament scriptures like they claim to, then they would really would have known that Jesus would have been a descendant of David. And we can look at 2 Timothy 2.8, which talks about, remember Jesus Christ, risen from the dead, the offspring of David as priest in my gospel. So in other words, they didn't really have the authorities of the scriptures just like they assumed that they did. Just as Jesus was challenged by the temple authorities in Luke chapter 20, so too the challenges come from those who assume to be the authority in our postmodern times. The atheists have assumed the authority because they are claiming to be scientific. But really, history repeats because we don't really learn from history. But if they are really claiming to be scientific, they would know God. In other words, the atheist of today is just assuming to be scientific and he or she is taking advantage of the fact that most people as non-scientists don't know the difference between 
real science and what they are promoting. So many of my conversations with atheists follow the same pattern, question, response, question, response, until they dare not ask me any more questions. The atheists stop asking me questions, not because of my superior intellect or oratory skills. I am a slave of the Lord Jesus. They stop asking me questions because they are the ones who are challenged. I challenge their assumed authority because I lead them with science to the feet of the Lord Jesus. And against Jesus, they have no counter-argument because Romans 14:11. For it is written, as I live, says the Lord, every knee shall bow to me and every tongue shall confess to God. And from this verse, Paul was quoting Isaiah 45, verse 23, where even he talks about every knee shall bow and every tongue shall swear allegiance. So because the atheists stop asking me questions after a certain point, they begin to realise that the authority is actually Jesus. And that the, pro the only proper response for them to continue the conversation is for them to acknowledge him. So you see really from uh, Romans 14.11 and Isaiah 45, you see, there is no need to fear these people or their insults because the whole universe belongs to the Lord. But we can even use their insults as an excellent opportunity to preach the gospel. So some of the things I've been called or heard atheists call other Christians are half-witted, unintelligent, brainless, second-grade intelligence, etc., etc. You get the picture. But I mean the irony of them calling me unintelligent when I've worked at four different universities plus a Bible college. <laughs> anyway, I use these insults as a gateway to Jesus. Yes, even this can be utilised for, for the work of the kingdom. So we know that Jesus said, turn the other cheek, from Matthew 5, uh, 5.39. But Jesus also taught, treat others how you want to be treated. So this is well known in scripture, Matthew 7, 12, Luke 6, 31, Galatians 5, 14, Romans 13, verses 8, and 8 to 9. But if you search this phrase, treat others how you want to be treated on the internet, you'll find it called something like the golden rule. And I'll get back to that in a moment. So the direction on how to witness to the people who insult you for being Christian is already laid out. Tell these people, treat others how you want to be treated. And also make them understand that this is the teaching of Jesus. I have used this very strategy to someone who was very rude to me once. In fact, they called me brainless amongst other things. And then I told them, Jesus' words, treat others how you want to be treated. And they had their own Luke 20, 40 moment. But when it comes to defending the faith uh, against attack, apologetics, I recommend thinking ahead. What I mean by this is think ahead of possible counter-attacks that you might receive in return. So in this regard, as we're talking about what's known as the golden rule, according to the internet, what I have done is thought ahead of a possible counter-attack to the golden rule. So if you just look at the Wikipedia page for the golden rule, it lists all these other religions and cultures that incorporate this rule from ancient Egypt to ancient Greece to Hinduism, Sikhism, Islam, ancient Rome, Chinese religions, 
New Age, even humanists are, are now hijacking this now and saying the golden rule is a humanist principle. So everyone is taking this. So what they are implying is that Jesus merely copied the golden rule from a more ancient source. It's like, well, but ironically, so far I haven't encountered anyone intelligent enough to try and even use this counter-argument. But never fear, there, there is a counter-argument with a counter-argument. <laughs> Firstly, you could, if you want to create a debate talking about the ancientness of the source of the golden rule, you know, who came up with it first, first, you can simply point out that Jesus and Paul were quoting from Leviticus chapter 19. So there's two instances in that chapter where the Lord is talking about treat, love your neighbour as yourself. And yeah, even in, in verse 34 talks about loving strangers as yourself. So it, you can go back to Leviticus if, if they want an older source. But you don't really want to go into kind of something like an unprovable debate to try and convince people that Leviticus is older than Hinduism or whatever because they're, they're secular. I mean, we, we know it is. But really what you need to say is if someone agrees with the golden rule, then that means they agree with Jesus because that is what Jesus said. And then people can have their own Luke 20, 40 moment because they realise who the authority really is. You see, we have plenty to work with here and I haven't even made it to any science yet. But when it comes to science, there is one thing you really need to know and this forms a central piece of factual information for my writing. Know this, chemistry is a fantastic science for apologetics. Why? Because its fudge factor is zero. So if you search this term on the internet, you get something like, a fudge factor is an ad hoc quantity or element introduced into a calculation formula or model in order to make it fit observations and expectations. So in other words, in chemistry, you cannot make stuff up. You have to follow strict protocols, strict experimental procedures, because you won't get anything to work. Ask any chemist this and they will agree. This is why chemistry is called a hard science. Contrast this to a soft science like biology or more precisely paleontology and anthropology, which are fields of, I guess, academic endeavours that are heavily populated with atheists. These are fields of science in which you cannot do any experiment because you are looking at things allegedly long past. You can see where I'm going with this, right? Because you cannot do a paleontology experiment here and now, all you have to do is go on the conclusion of an assumed authority, such as a paleontologist who said this happened long ago. And since more than likely this paleontologist or anthropologist or whatever they call themselves is more than likely an atheist, so they're anti-God, and of course he or she is going to say something that supports their own beliefs. They're biased. That's the whole point of this science thing that they're promoting. In other words, as the general public who are not scientists, they are expecting you to take their word for it. They are expecting us to take their word on faith because the long past is unseen. You see, what they want to do is blur the line between what's called historical science in the past and operational science, the here and now, the experiments. And they blur this line so much that they are relying on the average non-scientist 
to not note a difference. They want you to think it's all in the one thing. They want you to think they are being scientific. These people say they will believe in the science and only trust the science. They think they are, the, they, are on the, they are on the front foot. But for someone like me, science is exactly where I want them. What I bring up to them, so what I bring to them is, so what I bring up to them is, if they want to compare something back to the remote past and say it happened like this, as in historical science, then that really is pure speculation. In other words, they are making a faith statement, but it is a blind faith. However, the atheists will, will make a claim that the past is not unseen, and they may quote the fossil record, for example, but we, we will return to that in a moment. But we as Christians, we know what faith is. Faith is the assurance of things hoped for, the convictions of things not seen. Hebrews 11, verse 1. This is not blind faith. What blind faith is, is faith for evidence. What Christians have is faith from evidence. What do I mean? What I'm really saying is science doesn't lead to God, but science leads to faith in God. Since God is unseen, faith is a conviction of things not seen. In other words, science done properly leads to faith in God because there is more than enough evidence of the unseen. So let's just go into a few examples. DNA. DNA is a code of information, and where does information come from? Next example, there's talking about the fossil record. There was a thing that happened in the past uh, called the Cambrian explosion, and this shows that in the fossil record that life appeared very <gasps> abruptly, and that speaks very much of creation. And of course... The atheist doesn't like this because, yeah, it goes against exactly what they are uh, preaching about. But, but when it, sorry, but what the, um, but of course the atheists don't like this, and what the darkened mind likes to come up with because they are so biased is a theory to explain away the evidence. There are other cases used by atheists to explain why there is no evidence for another theory. Oh, sorry, I've probably messed that up. Sorry, atheists, there's another thing that atheists like to do is they like to make up theories and they use theories to explain why there's no evidence of another theory. So there's a, a prime example of this when it comes to what's called the search for alien life. Yes, I have talked about aliens with atheists, <laughs> surprisingly. So we know there's a program from NASA called SETI, S-E-T-I. It operates on the premise that apparently the evolutionary and nat naturalist explanation of life is so successful that life has popped up all over the universe and give it enough time, supposedly billions of years, this extraterrestrial life has supposedly become a super intelligent alien race, etc., etc. Well, guess what? We haven't found any, let alone any intelligent alien life. And you, you would think this is the end of the story, but you, you would be wrong. They have made up a theory to explain why there's no evidence of another theory. So SETI, S-E-T-I, has become CETI, S-E-E-T-I. This was proposed by one fellow, and he is proposing to search for extinct extraterrestrial life. So perhaps the greatest irony of all is apparently evolution is so successful that theoretical alien intelligence 
has managed to wipe itself out and become extinct. So you see, it's another example of a theory used to explain why another theory has no evidence. It's faith for evidence. It's blind faith. They are stumbling around in the dark. The blind faith is a conviction for things that just aren't there. As I mentioned, they love to keep everything theoretical because essentially you can say whatever you want in a theory. And what do they want? They want a theory without God in it. It's not rocket science. But here is where the real science comes in and more specifically the scientific method. And it serves as a powerful testimony for, the, for faith in God. Listen to those very carefully, those words carefully. It serves as a powerful testimony for faith in God. <coughs> Essentially what the scientific method does, it turns a theory into a law of nature through observation and experimentation. So if a theory is accurate, then scientific experiments confirm the theory as a law. So a law of nature means you can reproduce an experiment. So nature is repeatable, it is reproducible. In other words, what science really determines is nature is regular. We can only do science because nature is regular. The question is, why is nature regular? Because it was made that way. Regularity comes from intelligence. Irregularity comes from chance, chaos, or uncontrolled non-intelligence. So the mere fact that we can even do science means that there is an intelligibility behind the universe. This is just one example of faith from evidence, the hope for God, the intelligence behind the universe who is unseen. And going from this, I use an earth-shattering line to militant atheists. Virtually every single one of them has been an evolutionist. So I say, if evolution were true, why, after 170 years of the best science done by the best scientists, it is still only a theory and not a law of science? They really have no answer because they have just realised who the authority is. Luke 2040. The light shines. But the atheists will bemoan and wail because they want to keep everything theoretical. They love the darkness more than the light. They have said that only, they will only believe in God if science proves, exist, proves his existence. But what they really have done here is create a self rebuting statement. If science proves God, then God is, God is science. But then again, that's probably the point for the atheists because they want to make science their God or their version of science their God. But the greatest of ironies is that some atheists will write about that they definitely believe that God does not exist, but they are more than happy to believe that a universe is just one of a number of infinite, infinite number of universes, universes <laughs> which is something that is completely unprovable. That is, by definition, blind faith. But let's go back to the real science, and this is a very simple example. You can use it all the time. I do. And this is provable every and every day, and every and any day of the week, and that is life produces life. Very simple. It is called the law of biogenesis in science. It means what it, it means what it says. It says it means some, you know, something living, only something living produces life. There is no hidden meaning. Hidden meaning. It is basic science. And the one who refuses to acknowledge God runs into serious trouble when they come up against this. Because they refuse to accept the creation account in Genesis, if God is not the source of life for this people, then they have to make one up. 
But most of the time, those with a darkened mind will have no proper explanation for this because they just assume that happened somehow. Much of the atheistic literature completely glosses over the assumption that in some point in time, something non-living produced life somehow. They don't really tackle the question because they have no answer. But we as Bible-believing Christians can use this very effectively in preaching the gospel to those in, in the dark. It, I mean, it's certainly not a new argument, but again, the point, is, the point is to shine God's light. And this life produces life argument is simple and powerful because these people have to realise that they are completely going against the grain of some of the most basic science. So what some of these people have come up with, you might have heard of the famous Miller experiment where because life is based on chemicals, they, they assumed that chemicals gave rise to life. So they zapped a bunch of chemicals, which I thought was the ancient atmosphere. And what they really produced was just different chemicals. Yeah, they made some amino acids, but they didn't make life because non-living chemicals do not actually produce life. And historically, the result of this experiment has been taken far beyond its conclusion. No life was produced because chemicals are not living. And I happily point this out to hostile opponents, and, and they have no answer. Instead, a darkened mind that I mentioned this to came up with a long speculation how it supposedly happened in the distant past. And I asked him, can you repeat those conditions, supposed conditions, in an experiment today? And he admitted remarkably that we don't know why we cannot repeat it in an experiment today. I mean, talk about blindness. You see, this is such an effective argument because the answer is so simple. Anyone can use it. The answer is they cannot repeat the speculation because it didn't happen that way because life produces life. So at this point in a conversation, we can bring God into the equation and we can say this. Life first began on earth because God, as the living God, gave rise to life on earth. Simple. Life produces life. It's provable any day of the week. Oh, that's preposterous, they say. Bringing God into the, into the discussion is silly, quote, unquote. But the response is I haven't violated any science at all. Life produces life. Another Luke 2040 moment. Though there is plenty of verses in the Bible about the living God, like Psalm 42, 2, and Luke 20, verse 38, actually, when the Sadducees asked about the resurrection, God is not the God of the, of the dead, but of the living for to him we are all alive. But this is not even my favourite argument to defend the faith. My favourite argument of all is God is light. 1 John 1 5. More and more atheists love to scurry over to one little phrase, and that is God doesn't exist. I have responded to this phrase in many ways, but one way I do now is God is light, and since light exists, therefore God exists. Of course, some people don't like this answer. And one fellow responded to me, he's like, that's the most ridiculous thing I've ever heard. First, you have to prove that God exists, then prove that God is light, etc., etc. But really, the answer is even more profoundly powerful. You can say in the end he had his own Luke 2040 moment. There's another way we can look at this. God is light. We know from science that light is eternal. That's right. We know at the speed of light, time does not exist, meaning light is timeless. Light is eternal. Science proves, proves this. It's a phenomenon called time dilation. Time slows to a stop at the speed of light. Therefore, as God is light, therefore God is eternal. 
a very powerful argument. So the response to the above atheists who might counterattack this, you can explain it this way. Since science demonstrates that God, sorry, that light is eternal and timeless, and remember, they always ask for the science, give the science, therefore, eternity exists. Then the conversation can be steered towards, are you ready for eternity? See, the Christian faith is faith from evidence, and that evidence is hard science, which is undeniable. And since eternity exists, therefore God must exist because, and here is something very powerful, for anything that is not light, that is material matter, our flesh, atoms, our bones, etc., all of, all of these things are not eternal. In other words, we are in time. It is temporary. And we know this again from science, that anything that is not light cannot reach the speed of light. So therefore, anything made of matter, the physical stuff of the universe, is not eternal. Remember, time only stops at the speed of light. Therefore, since we are made of matter, we are not living in eternity. This is obvious and makes 100% perfect sense with the real science because time is a property of matter. And the science behind this is slightly complicated and I won't really go into the full details, but I do write about it. And so what this really means was time was created when matter was created, meaning that time is a property of matter. So truly, truly, I tell you, we are living in a temporary existence in this world of matter. So this all means that eternity must be a place of light, whether people like it or not. And this is what the science says, the real science, the hard science. So we can rephrase the argument for God. Since light exists, therefore a plate, sorry, a, therefore a place without time must also exist, and that place is called eternity. Therefore, since light is not matter, then immaterial stuff must exist. And we call that spirit. And since spirit exists, therefore God must exist as God is spirit. So this comes to the very crux of today. Since you know that eternity is very real and just as light is real, then are you ready for eternity? Are you ready for your, your spiritual existence for the time when you leave your material fleshly body behind? Because in that spiritual existence there is light and that light is God and there is not even a tiniest speck of darkness there. It is pure light. The darkness in our own bodies cannot stand in God's light. Literally his pure light will see right through you and call you to account. There is only one covering that can appropriate, that would, sorry, that we can appropriate that will cover our own personal darkness in God's light. And that is the name, the blood, the risen life and the lordship of Jesus. His sheep hear his voice, come, believe. There was a voice from heaven in Revelation 18.4 that cried when Babylon fell, come out of her, my people. John 12.46 says, I have come as the light into the world that whoever believes in me shall not abide in darkness. Jesus stood and cried out saying in John 7:37, If anyone thirsts, let him come to me and drink. Yes, Lord, we are thirsty. Come, believe. For the first time in your life you'll be able to truly see. because you will have the light. Just as the living God gave you your physical life, the living God will give you your spiritual life, eternal life. Leave those dead gods behind, you know, those things that are idols that can control your life. 
The only thing that makes these dead gods in your life come alive is your life that you put into them through your time and your energy. This information was, that was presented today, things like the golden rule, God is life, God is light, you cannot remain neutral to it. You cannot ignore it. It is the truth. It is scientific. You don't have to pay the account of your darkness if you embrace the light of Jesus. Let us pray. Father, we thank you for the free gift of the Lord Jesus. Romans 6.23, the free gift of God is the eternal life in Jesus Christ our Lord. We thank you, Father, that you have chosen us to be sowers of your seed. Even if it is as tiny as a mustard seed, it still grows according to your watering. Father, we pray that you water the seeds that we plant in darkened hearts and minds in Jesus' name. We pray that these seeds reach reach fertile ground and not rocky ground where it cannot take its root. Father, we fully acknowledge that you are sovereign and we ask that you, Lord, that you offer these darkened minds, you, you offer them repentance. For it is written in 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 24, And the Lord's servant must not be quarrelsome, but be kind to everyone, able to teach, patiently enduring evil, correcting his opponents with gentleness. God may perhaps grant them repentance leading to the knowledge of truth. Father, we ask you to water the seeds sown that you may make it grow so that you can offer them repentance. Amen.